Uh, welcome on our Wednesday evening, our new series in the Book of Acts. Uh, you know what? To me, this is just like confirmation. This is where we're supposed to be, right? That's something spiritual. We'll say we're going ahead as God's church um, tonight. Go ahead. You know what? Go ahead and turn right in your Bibles to Acts chapter 1 because I'm just, I'm basically ready to go. Announcements by now, come on. You guys should be able to tell me what's going on in this church. Make sure you grab a bulletin or something uh, if you need one. You can grab one out at the Connection Center there, the counter. Um, ask questions of Pastor Tim. Don't ask me anything. Just ask Tim. <laughs> He'll answer your questions for you. Um, my name is Raj Ahuja, and I'm going to share God's word with you right now. Acts chapter 1. Hang on just a second. I'm going to get this thing, the technicals on this thing going. Um, so Acts chapter 1, the reason why it seemed like this was the way for us to go is, well, Easter, a few weeks ago, right? Easter was about the ascension of our Lord coming back from the tomb alive. And what the Lord did was show himself to his disciples, show himself to many, many hundreds of people. And what did he do then? He said, wait, wait, because I'm going to use you for some really great things. But before I do that, the Holy Spirit, God, the Holy Spirit is going to come upon you and I'm going to send you out. And you guys, I've just been so like fired up as of late to send you out, so to speak, for us to really, really just be the church, be the ones called by the Lord to do what the Lord himself did. We're going to see in this study here where actually it's pretty amazing that Jesus was limited. And let me tell you what I mean by Jesus being limited. Before uh, the Lord gave us the Holy Spirit, to come upon us, to dwell within us, what's called the launching of the church age. Before the launching of the church age, you had Jesus who was here on earth. And he had a call. The call was to tell the world, man, repent. You need salvation. I am that promised savior. And so Jesus went from place to place and he told the world in a limited way because he could only go so far all about him. When Jesus left the earth, what he said was, my task was limited. Like all I could do was minister right here in this little area. And now I am anointing you. I am empowering you. And I am <laughs> demanding of you. You go. Why? Because now I can be everywhere at once. It's amazing what the book of Acts indicates. It takes Jesus the singular, and it makes Jesus the plural. It takes Jesus from a limited spot here, and it allows Jesus to go across the entire globe. What it's saying is that the Christian church, the church of Christ, the people who are Christians, man, we are Jesus, right? And you understand what I'm saying when I say that. It's nothing weird, but we are Jesus. In other words, we are empowered with the power of the Lord. And if Jesus, the Lord, went from place to place and said, hey, you need the kingdom, you need God, well then, oh, representative of Christ, you and I were supposed to do the same thing. See, that's what the book of Acts is all about. That's what's supposed to put the passion in God's people. This is what he's going to do when he talks to the people right up front in Acts chapter 1. We're going to be in verses 1 through 11. And I just want to point out to you sort of the way God motivates the guys you know, I'm talking about the disciples, the original guys, to go and be the church, to go and do what he has empowered them to do. That's where we start today. But the book of Acts, you guys, that's what, that's what it's all about. So here's what we'll do. We'll pray right now, and then we'll look at the text and see what it is that God wants us to know this evening, okay? Lord, thank you so much for a beautiful, a beautiful night. Lord, for an opportunity to kind of just get away from the, from the work week a little bit. Lord, to come in here together and to, just to hang out with each other. Lord, to sing songs of praises and worship to you because you are so worthy to be worshiped. And Lord, now the privilege of 
studying your word, growing in your Bible. Lord, we know this is our food. Uh, God, we ask you, please nourish us. Tonight, Lord, we pray that, that you would speak to us mightily through these words, that you would edify us, please. We want to grow in the things of Christ. Uh, Lord, we pray for power. Lord, we pray for that kind of refreshed energy for all of us, Lord, right now and as we go from here. Um, we want to we wanna be your people. Uh, you are our Lord. We love you, and we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, you guys, so we're going to read the first 11 verses of Acts chapter 1. Now, I asked the media team to put those verses on the screen just in case it was a little dark, but it kind of looks like you might be able to read it on your own. If you can't, that's okay, because here it comes. All right. It says, in the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up, after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Verse six. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons that the father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Oh, that's my favorite verse in the whole book. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Oh, man. Okay, so Luke, the doctor. You've heard this, Luke, the doctor. And he is, believe it or not, the author of Luke. It's true. It's, he, he's the guy. Now, this is what we call Luke part two. This is Luke, and he's writing to Theophilus, by the way, Theophilus, interesting in the Greek, Theo, meaning God, phileo, meaning love, so Theophilus can be translated lover of God, but Theophilus would probably be Luke's master, okay, Luke being a physician, and the, the thing back then, which I wish you could do right now, is rich people owned their doctors, Generally speaking, right? That's what happened. They had slaves for everything. And they're like, you know, I got so much dough. I think I'm going to hire me a guy just to hang out and like take my temperature and, and take care of me whenever and write prescriptions for antibiotics. So Luke was considered to be the personal physician to Theophilus. And the idea goes something like this. Paul ministers the gospel to Theophilus. He tells him about Jesus. Theophilus listens, and he goes, okay, and he receives Christ. Paul and Theophilus have a very special relationship. Paul is now going off to do all of his missionary work. Theophilus knows that Paul, remember it said that Paul is a pretty, like he's not a very healthy guy. The, uh, this is, again, you guys, right now what I'm quoting you, it's more like kind of uh, church quote history. Um, he has a heart for Paul, and he says, well, go ahead and take my personal physician. This is kind of what thoughts are as to how Luke and Paul would have connected. Like Theophilus might have been the middleman. It makes for interesting study. You might think that, you might not, but it's just very interesting study for sure. So here is Luke, and we know beginning at Acts chapter 16, well, we know that Luke is with him because you see uh, those personal pronouns, you know, the plurals, they become we 
They become us. It's, it's Luke saying, I was in it, O Theophilus. And they start talking about all the stuff that was happening and all the crazy things the Lord took them through and all the awesome, you know, the, the, um, the fruit of the ministry it was telling them all about that. So, so uh, Luke, that's who Luke is. Theophilus would be that person. And this would be how he sort of worked in with the life of Paul. Now, in this particular case, what we're looking at is the story of Jesus addressing his disciples for the final time, for the last time before he ascends into heaven. Um, why did Jesus stick around for 40 days, I was once asked by a little seven-year-old. Why did he stay for 40 days? Why didn't he just go to heaven when he came out of the tomb? And I said, little girl, that's what I would have done. But that's not, what I, that's not what Jesus did. Why did Jesus stick around for 40, for 40 days before he ascended? Remember, we call him going to heaven the ascension. Why, why, did, he, why did he stick around? Well, there are a few reasons that are going to be really significant to understand. And you, you see them basically here. And you'll, you'll work them through as you go through the book of Acts. Number one, what we understand is that Jesus needed to make sure everybody knew he was still alive. One of the reasons why Jesus didn't just go right up to heaven after he came from the tomb was because he wanted to go from place to place. It says for those 40 days, he went, for, you know, throughout the, the, basically those who were his disciples and he revealed himself. He showed himself alive. Now, Obviously, Jesus understood what effect that would have on the people because it did change their lives. It absolutely transformed them. Eleven guys who never showed up at the cross or at the tomb, they had to be told to come and check it out. Once they, are, once they see Jesus in the flesh, so to speak, and, you know, in this, in this flesh, um, eleven of them die martyrs deaths, if I can include Paul now. 11 of them are tortured and killed pretty, pretty disgusting deaths. I think it was John who was the one disciple, they say, or the one apostle. Uh, Nero tried to boil him in oil. Uh, tradition tells us that he didn't die, so he was sent to the Isle of Patmos, and he lived essentially a secluded life there. Um, he writes Revelation there, and those are dedicated people. And the reason they're dedicated is because they have been shown by Jesus himself, I am alive, and I am who I said I am. So that would have been one of the reasons why Jesus stuck around for the 40 days there. What else? What else? Um, I told you about ushering in the church age. I'm going to talk about the church age in future studies. So I'm just giving you a very limited understanding of what the church age is. But the church age now is where salvation is understood to be by grace. It is, the, it is faith in Christ's finished work in Jesus Christ and that you are then given uh, salvation by God based on his grace. Also, what happens in the church age, like I told you in the beginning, was everybody then is indwelt by God himself, and that is God the Holy Spirit. And so we are then empowered by the Holy Spirit, and we can fulfill the Great Commission. This is what we do in the church age, and the church age lasts until the church goes away. So from that moment Jesus went to the time Jesus comes to take us away, is known as the period, the church age. Okay, so the other, the other reasons that Jesus stuck around for 40 days, obviously, this, this should be obvious, encouragement, just to encourage his disciples, um, reinforcing the things he had already taught them for three years. Yeah, for sure. Because you know that they kind of got it, but a lot that they didn't get. And so Jesus probably reinforced much of what he told them 
during their ministry together? Yeah, I would say so. Um, what else? How about to allay their fears and doubt? Jesus, you're leaving us? I mean, like we could, we can hardly even do what we did before with you around. You're going you're gonna to go now? What are, we, what are we supposed to do? And Jesus basically is going to tell them, fear not. And don't worry, I have, I have the perfect remedy here. In fact, it's going to be beyond that. It is going to empower you to do things you didn't even realize you'd be able to do. So that 40-day period, was, it was fruitful. But you got to think it from heaven's perspective. Praise God, from heaven's perspective, so much fruit was produced because Jesus didn't just go into heaven right after he was resurrected from the dead. Now, we are today not going to highlight the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And the reason why is because that deserves at least a study. In fact, I'm praying and considering whether I should make it a two-parter because it's such a big deal. We deal with it right at the beginning of Acts. So I'm sort of going to skip the baptism of the Holy Spirit this evening, and I am instead just going to focus on the ascension itself, which is why you can see the title, What Jesus Ascension Means. Okay, so remember again, ascend, ascension, was that moment in history when Jesus was taken up into heaven. Okay, verse 9. If you, if you can, follow with me in verse 9 in your, in your Bibles. It says, And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. Now, verse 12 tells you that they were on the Mount of Olives when this, when this happened. Interestingly enough, the very place that he is going to come back to when he reestablishes his kingdom on this earth. Anyway, it says he was lifted up. Uh, epairo in the Greek is such a curious word. I, had to, I have so many Greek studies on this, I should just basically give it to you in Greek. But <laughs> I hate you up and walk. But this, um, this word, I want you to understand that there is a significance to it. Please notice it says that Jesus didn't go up it says Jesus was epairo. He was lifted or taken. The implication is it was by the power of another. Because one of the things we think about when Jesus goes is like, hey, I'm God. Like, look, I rose from the dead. And he could just be like, whoop, and off he goes. And there's a cloud that kind of meets him. The implication here is that from the moment, from the second, from the instant that Jesus starts his ascension, it wasn't by himself that the actual power behind this was elsewhere. And that's what makes this so curious is because it says, and a cloud took him out of their sight. You guys know what cloud represents in the Old Testament? Remember the glory of God? Remember the Shekinah glory? It says that when Moses built the tabernacle, as soon as he was finished, this is in um, uh, Exodus 40, it says that as soon as he builds the tabernacle, uh, the glory of God falls like a cloud. It's the Shekinah cloud. And, and it says that the people couldn't even come into the tabernacle as long as the Shekinah, the cloud, was there. Um, that's the power. That's God. That's the, that's the power and presence of God right there. And it says here, you can associate that God with the very act of Jesus' ascension. In fact, you could say that Jesus didn't have anything to do with his own taking up himself. That's the implication of epairo there. And here's why I think that's so cool to understand from that sort of technical standpoint, you guys, because it tells you, to me, if I could summarize it, it would be like this. It tells you, job well done, as in stamp of approval. Like Jesus, you don't have to guess whether you did it right um, Jesus, you don't have to skip. Don't you skip any step. I want you to know, says the Father of heaven, I want you to know what you did was perfect. What you did, come on home. It is finished. See, when you look at he was taken up, I want you to think 
It is a confirmation of it is finished. This is, this is one of the beautiful things about the recording here as Luke gives it to us in the book of Acts. Now, with that said, with that little detail, how about talking about the significance then of the ascension itself? If I were to ask somebody, give me a few highlight points, what is so significant about the virgin birth? People would be able to say, well, you know what it does? It proves that actually Jesus is God. Um, what it does is it fulfills all these prophecies. You'd be able to probably give a few points. And if I said, so give me a few points about the significance of Jesus' life, you'd be like, oh, where do I begin? I have so many of those. I'd say, give me a few points about Jesus on the cross and his death. And for most, by the way, if you're new to Christianity or something, you'll get there, okay? If you're not one of those, you're like, Raj, no, actually, I couldn't tell you anything. It's okay, you'll get there. But for the most part, if I said, give me, give me points about the death, you'd, you'd be able to give me something. If I said, give me a couple of highlight points about the resurrection, you'd be able to give me some points. But what if I said, give me some highlight points about the ascension, the actual taking up of Jesus? We, don't, we probably don't have as many key points as we would on any of those. And that's kind of also what drove me to say, let's just kind of land on the ascension itself. How about if we understand some of those key keys to, to, what it, to what it means, okay? I made it simple. This is a little three-parter. I'm doing what they call the traditional sermon, a three-part. And it's going to go like this. I'm going to break it up into the, significant, the, sig the significance of the ascension. And there are three things that I want to highlight, okay? The first one, by the way, a great study. I actually took these words from Warren Wearsby. So if you want a really cool study on, on um, the ascension, uh, uh, check out his book, okay? It's, it's really good. I, I tried to come up with like my own words for this stuff. I'm like, dude, you nailed it. Like, I'm just gonna take yours. So at least I'm giving him credit here, okay? This is, this is Mr. Wearsby on these three words that he, he gave me, <laughs> he, he put in his book. Um, the first one, he uses the word exaltation. Exaltation. And then the second significant part of the ascension was edification. Edification. And then finally is the world's condemnation. Okay, so first was the exaltation of Jesus. We'll talk about that. Then we're going to talk about the edification for you. And we'll define what edification means. And then finally, we'll talk about how his ascension signifies the world's condemnation. And again, we'll define these words for you, okay? But those are big deals. To exalt Jesus, to edify the church, and to condemn the world. All in the act of the ascension. All right, first one was the exaltation, right? Uh, exalt means to raise up in power. Exalt means to bring to rank, um, to elevate in honor. That is to exalt. So this is about Jesus' exaltation. John said this in chapter 17 and verse 5. I'm sorry, Jesus said this in John chapter 17, verse 5. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. Jesus is God. His birth on earth wasn't the start of Jesus. Jesus is, Jesus was, Jesus always will be God. And what it tells us in the Bible is that when he came to earth, he emptied himself. We're going to study that in Philippians. That's where it comes from, uh, Philippians chapter 2. He emptied himself when he came to the earth. He emptied himself of what we call his glory, his heavenly glory. Um, came as a man, lived as a man, and died 
as a man. Now, he never gave up his deity, right? He's always God, even while he was walking the earth. But what he did give up that was his was his glory. So he kept his deity, but he emptied himself of his glory. And it's interesting, the prayer that Jesus prays in John chapter 17, in essence, get me back. His exaltation is what he was praying for. Now, we understand the character of Christ, so he's not saying it from a selfish point of view. He's not saying it because it felt good. I think that if you read into what Jesus' words were there, it was all about what? The communion of the Father and the Son, right? He's waiting. He wants to get back with Dad. And he knows that the only way he's going to be able to get into heaven is in glorified form. You and I, by the way, beloved, when we die and we go to heaven, we will have a glorified form because you can't be in heaven unless you have a glorified form. But again, this is the kind of details I'm going to talk to you guys about in future studies. So, so, so the ascension was, in essence, a, 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 a refilling of his glory. Philippians 2, 4, empty me. Ascension, refill me. And he goes back to heaven. Now, now John... Um, He's in the Isle of Patmos. Remember when he writes the letter to uh, the Revelation, when he writes Revelation? Uh, he has these visions of Jesus. I'm going to read you. This is going to be on the screen. I want you to check it out. Look what he says of what he saw in this Jesus. I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me. And when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And among the lampstands was someone like a son of man dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet and with a golden sash around his chest. The hair on his head was white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and coming out of his mouth was a sharp double-edged sword. His face was like the sun shining in all its brilliance. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and he said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead. And now look, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and Hades. Do you think that in their three years together, um, Jesus ever placed his right hand on John somewhere? Chances are yes. Do you think when that had happened, John somehow like was going to fall over dead because of what he saw in Jesus? No, Jesus was kind of like one of them. But notice that very same Jesus with whom he had a most intimate relationship. What did he call himself? The disciple whom Jesus loved. This is him looking at that same Jesus. But this time it is totally different. Why? Because this is Jesus Christ, God, in his glory. That's the definition of revelation when they see Jesus. Um, um, revelation 19. Check this out. This will be on the screen as well. Talking about the second coming, you know, when, when um, Jesus takes over. He goes, I saw heaven standing open and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and wages war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. The armies of heaven were following him. <laughs> That's going to be us. Riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh, he has his name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That's the Jesus who ascended. 
That is the glorious one. That is the one who ha is in his glory. People today will tell you, oh, Jesus died. And they've got this picture of this humble little, you know, the carpenter, shepherd, whatever the pictures are right on the screens. And they'll just say, you know, he had a pretty miserable death, but oh, do they think about him this way? Oh, I hope so. Because that's who he is. See, Jesus is no longer that humble, meek little carpenter guy who's kind of at the whim of the Romans who lashed at him and the Jews who accused him and all of those things. No, no, no. He's the king of kings and he's the Lord of lords. Again, you guys, we don't think about the ascension as being a flat out tangible demonstration of revelation. But this would be one of the significant points of that very act of Jesus ascending into heaven. It's, it's, it's the glory. So, so, so that's one of the things. The second significant part regarding Jesus' exaltation is what I already told you. And that is, heaven gave him a stamp of approval. What the, the exaltation is this, God saying, perfectly done. Perfectly done. The plan that we came up with since, he, since before the creation of the world, you, man, you, uh, every single point, every piece, you accomplished absolutely and utterly without flaw. Jesus said to the crowds, the son does nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees his father do. He said, separately, I don't speak on my own, but only what the Father has commanded me. See, Jesus had expectations, and he even acknowledged it to crowds. He goes, if you see me do anything, anything that you couldn't attribute to God himself, then I have utterly failed, then I am a deceiver in essence. He even put himself to that account right in front of the crowds. And he, he, he got it, didn't he? I mean, come on, prophecy after prophecy and all of these things that we saw him do. And here's God the Father saying, good, you know, epi arrow, here I come, the cloud. I will lift you on, uh, lift you upward to heaven. So the exaltation, main points in the ascension. Uh, point number one was the glory. And point number two there was the approval of heaven and being taken up. Okay, so that would be the ascension sort of major point number one, the, the exaltation of Christ. I want to go right into point number two. You remember it was the edification of the church or Christian, you being edified because of the ascension. How does the ascension edify you? And we got little three sub points here that I'm going to give to you, okay? First of all is this. It allowed him to send the Holy Spirit. And talk about an edifying act, you bet. It says in John 14, beginning at verse 15, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. Put yourself in those guys' shoes, okay? When, they're, when Jesus is actually mouthing the words. Uh, they're sort of on the crux. They're sort of on the verge. There's doubt. They're kind of questioning. They're kind of like, well, way, whoa. There's something going on, and they've even been with him personally for three years. And, and Jesus sees these guys and what's going on. He understands that if they've been with him for three years and they still aren't getting it right, he's given them the great commission. They know he's not going to be with them. They're going to be like, are you kidding me? What? I quit. You, you notice how um, there Jesus uses the word orphans. I won't leave you. Did I put that there? He won't leave you by orphans uh, as orphans. If it's not there, there's another place where he does do that. I thought I had it there. 
Okay, you guys, I left out a verse, but that's okay. So he says to them, I will not leave you as orphans. And, the, and in, the, in the day, uh, the orphan would have been considered the most helpless, uh, the most hopeless. You know, they didn't have the caretakers like we do today. The orphan was out on the street, and if you were an orphan, you were helpless, hopeless, death before you. And it's, it's interesting that Jesus actually uses that term. And he goes, don't worry. I'm not going to leave you as orphans. I'm not going to leave you helpless. I'm, I'm not going to leave you hopeless. No, 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 no. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you another. I'm going to give you the helper. Of course, another. Have you heard this one? Alos in the Greek, another. It means another of the same kind. Another who is equal in quality because there are other words for another, like meaning a substitute, a near substitute, stuff like that. No, another helper here is very intentionally called another just like me, you know, in all, in all quality and in all character. That's who Jesus was. He was their helper. He was their comforter. He, what other words can you think of, right, for the Spirit? Jesus was all of those things. And now Jesus knows the church age is to come. So he says, don't worry, I'm still with you. I leave you the Holy Spirit who was another just like me. And we know that the Holy Spirit is the third of the Trinity, of the triune Godhead. We call him the triune Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. So here you have the Son saying, don't worry, I'm going to send. <laughs> I'm going to send God. And he's going to be, and he's going to be with you. Um, that's edifying to a believer, isn't it? It's pretty edifying. Edifying means to build up, to keep strong. I would say so. <laughs> what else? Let me give you another couple of points here about how the ascension, the act of the ascension, builds you and builds me up. Um, it meant we now have a high priest. One of my favorite, one of my favorite terms for Jesus as high priest. It means that he is, one, he is our high priest. It says in Hebrews 8 and verse 1. Now the main point of what we are saying is this, the writer of the Hebrews goes. We do have such a high priest who sat down at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven. You see, the throne, everybody knew signifies the place of greatest power and authority and um, influence. And this is what the high priest always got to occupy. And so if this Jesus occupies that throne in heaven itself, that means infinite. That means ultimate. That means you don't have to back down because he's the one who's there for you and there for me. That throne he occupies has you in mind. We'll talk about that as well in future studies. Um, what else? He occupies, he's high priest. How about, um, <laughs> how about the fact that he is our advocate, our heavenly defense attorney? The ascension confirms that he indeed is our heavenly defense attorney. John wrote in 1 John chapter 2, My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin, but you're gonna, <laughs> but, because everybody does, but if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous, parakletos, the one who comes along to help, the one who comes along to advocate. That's what, that's what he said. Now remember, John has a, a courtroom, like a vision here. It's, it's very specific. Like it's very precise. And I was thinking about the same little courtroom picture. Let's, let's go for it. Heaven's courtroom. Here's kind of what I would think. So you've got the judge, and that's God the Father. And you've got a prosecuting attorney. You know what his name is? Satan. Yeah, it is. And, and um, 
Satan sees you, Satan sees me commit sin of whatever type. And he immediately takes the evidence to the judge and says, this man needs to stand trial. This woman needs to stand trial because she has committed, <laughs> before your eyes, sin. And can I just tell you this? Listen, did you know that Satan basically always has an airtight case? It's so weird to say this, but he's never wrong. When he takes the accusation of your sin before God, the act that he is going to declare before God is a sin. It is something that will fall short of the glory of God. It is something that will stray from God's perfect standards. Satan knows these things. So he will take that act, go before the judge and say, judge him. Now again, I'm guilty, man. Satan's got it. He's got an airtight case. But here's the thing. The wonder and the beauty is that it doesn't kind of just stop there. Huh? Not in heaven's court. Uh, because what happens is I don't have to plead my own case. I have this defense attorney, this parakletos, this advocate. And what it teaches us in scripture is that he actually looks at the judge and he essentially says this, your honor, don't charge that sin to his righteousness. Don't charge that to Raj in and of himself. Instead, since I died for Raj and any of the sin that Raj would commit, please charge it to my account of righteousness. And God goes, well, yours paid for it all. Like your righteousness was truly righteous. Yours was the only righteous that could actually pay off the debt called sin. Yours is the only righteousness that can actually wipe the slate clean. And Jesus goes, yes, your honor, that's right. And so God, of course, being that fair judge that he is, says, well, then I declare Raj hereby not guilty, in fact, innocent. Because he sees me through my advocate, the Paracletos, the helper. This is, this is what I know. Isn't it the greatest thing? This is the picture, you guys, that we're supposed to keep. But it's the ascension in its act that got this sort of, to me, I, I kind of call it the proof. The act of the ascension. If he was just standing around on the ground on the Mount of Olives and saying, you know, I hope, I hope, then we wouldn't have this. But this is the case. That is an edification to any believer. I want to address just real quickly Christians who carry guilty consciences. I want you to understand something. I don't know if that's you. You might be one of those believers who says, I know I'm forgiven. But I want you to, to take very seriously your insistence that there is still some kind of a justification for feeling guilty about what you've done or that it is in, that it is, that, it, that there's any validity to it. Because one of the things pastors will often hear from people is, I know God forgave me. I did it eight years ago. I did it one week ago. And I just broke down and I begged the Lord forgiveness. And I know he forgave me, but we have to understand what we minimize when we say, I'm, I still feel guilty. We are minimizing the true power and purpose of Jesus himself in heaven. See, we don't think about it. We, we always, one of the things I tell you guys constantly from the pulpit is always have heaven's perspective. It's always from heaven's perspective that you take on, how should I feel about this? What should I still think about this? And if the judge in heaven declares you not guilty and casts that sin as far as the east is from the west, you are not guilty. It is a done deal. So this is one of those things that actually let it edify you. Think about it from a new perspective, perhaps, that you haven't been thinking about. And God will uh, edify you for sure. Okay, let's, we got to move on here. As usual, I talk too much. So... Another thing is this, consider um, 
another edifying truth about Jesus. Ready? This is what it says. Uh, Romans 8, verse 34. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Okay, you get those last words? Is also interceding um, for us. Hebrews 7.25 should be your cross-reference to Romans 8.34, okay? Romans 8.34 and Hebrews 7.25, and here's what Hebrews 7.25 says. Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. This is like staggering truth. You want to be edified? Let me tell you something. You personally... Like you can look at a mirror and you can go, you are always on the heart and on the lips of Jesus in heaven. Those, I, again, you guys, as far as studying the words, always means always. It doesn't say there's an exception there when Jesus decides, you know what, I think I'm going to put Raj's name down. I'm sick of saying his name. His name just like, ugh. Can he like pick a better name? You know, Jesus doesn't say that kind of stuff. He goes... Father, I want to lift up your son. Father, now I want to lift up your son. Father, now I want to plead for your son. Father, now I want to intercede for your son. Do you understand that that's what Jesus does in heaven? There is not an idle moment for Jesus. Sometimes when we say he sits on the throne, we literally just kind of think he's going like this, like just sitting there. Like he's like, oh, is it my turn to rapture my church? Okay, God, I'm going, right? That's not what he's doing. It says that he's constantly active. And it turns out that you're the reason he's active. And I'm the reason he's active. Let me read that real quickly again. Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him, which every Christian has done, gone to God through him. He says, because he always lives to intercede for them. Romans 8. He is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Never think that Jesus twiddles his thumbs, okay? You're on his mind 24-7. And he is talking to the Father about you. How could that not be edifying? The ascension, you see, confirms those texts. If he hadn't have been, forget it. Okay, that's edification. So we had exaltation of Jesus because of the ascension. We have edification of the body or the Christian because of his ascension. Finally, this is the word that people don't like to talk about, the condemnation. The ascension confirms the condemnation. Another word that our Bibles will say, conviction. It'll sort of intermingle those, but technically speaking, there is a difference. So I'm using condemnation. I agree with Wearsby on this one. I'm going to use condemnation, even though some scriptures will actually say convict. All right, so um, John 16, beginning at verse 8. Look what, look what it says. And when he comes, this is speaking about the Holy Spirit. He will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin because they do not believe in me. Concerning righteousness because I go to the Father and you will see me no longer. Concerning judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. Now, who is Jesus speaking about here? It is, not, it is not those who are in Christ. It is not the saved. This is all about the unsaved. Notice, interesting, huh? The ascension addresses heaven. It, ident it addresses um, God's people. And it addresses the world or the unsaved people. The act of the ascension hits it's every, every group. And that's what this is talking about right here, that the Holy Spirit would be here in order to accomplish these things. Let me, let me explain them for a little bit before I, I go on with that. Um, he says, the Holy Spirit will be in the world, right? Jesus will not. He's ascended. The Holy Spirit will be in the world. He says, concerning sin to convict. And I, 
I want to point out, you guys put that back up. Hey, media team, put John 16 verses 8, 9, 10, 11 back up on the screen. It says, and when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness. I want you please to notice very intentionally the word sin is singular uh, in verse 9, concerning sin. Notice that? It is a singular, it is not plural. And, and the reason I particularly that matters to me is because I deal with a lot of people who say, if I'm more good than not good, God will accept me. If I, if I quote, don't do a lot of sins, I'm going to be accepted by heaven. And what the Bible makes very clear here is that it is a single sin that God actually judges us for. You know, technically, we only go to hell for one sin. What is that sin? The rejection, the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. What does that mean? To reject God, and that is to say through Christ. It is whether you believe in Jesus or not. If you reject the salvation that Jesus offers, that is singular the sin that you will be judged for. See, because that one act on your part will take care of every other sin. It takes care of the plural. And this is where people get it all mixed up. They think that they can take care of the plural. It can't be done. We, we don't have the righteousness the Bible declares in and of ourselves. Man, our righteousness is like filthy rags. So forget plural sins. You could name every sin all day long and pretend that you don't do them. That's not, that's not you know, from heaven's point of view. Oh, no. It goes much beyond that. And the only way then that we are going to have the righteousness we need is by having it, remember this word imputed, having it imputed upon us. That is to say transferred from Christ to us. His righteousness is imputed upon every believer and that's how we stand righteous before God. That's why it's singular. And this is what the Holy Spirit will do. He will not convict you on whether you cheated on your taxes. I'm talking to unbelievers. Believers, he'll, he'll probably convict you if you try to cheat on your taxes. But as far as unbelievers go, his conviction will come because of what you're doing with Jesus Christ. Are you rejecting him as your savior? Well, then this applies to you. And what it tells us is you are facing what's called condemnation. And condemnation is ultimately an eternal separation from, from God. And it is ultimately in a, in a real place, hell. And that was a place we know that was designed and created for Satan and the rebellious angels, uh, those who flat out rejected Jesus. So when Jesus says that the Holy Spirit comes concerning sin, he says, because they do not believe in me. He goes on in the next section there, he says, concerning righteousness. So now the Holy Spirit not only convicts for, you know, lack of faith or unbelieving in Jesus, he also convicts regarding righteousness. And he says in the rest of that, because I go to the Father and you will see me no more. And what does he mean? I'm ascended, so once I'm ascended, here comes. He says that people will be convicted on, on this righteousness because I go to the Father and you won't see me anymore. In essence, Jesus' ascension is a message to the world that only he has the righteousness acceptable to heaven. He meets the criteria, he alone. What he's doing is he's showing the world that somebody can get to heaven. So he is the proof that it takes righteousness, right standing. That's another way of saying righteousness, okay? Right standing, to be right standing in God. But the key to God's righteousness is it is perfectly right. 
And so what Jesus says here is the Holy Spirit will convict you of righteousness because they will see that only I have been the one who has ascended. Uh, only I am the one who ascended as the, as the resurrected Savior. And the Holy Spirit will utilize that, use that, and basically point out to people, um, you don't meet that criteria, right? So he says, because you no longer see me. Why? Because I meet the perfect standard of righteousness. Nobody else does. So the Holy Spirit will convict them for that. Okay? That's righteousness. So first was sin, meaning your, what you do in terms of your faith in Christ. The second is righteousness, meaning right standing with God. Both of those no go, because the key is Jesus. And then what was the, what was the final one? The final one was, um, let me read that here. I got to scroll. Concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. What Jesus says is, by my ascension, by my act of ascension, in essence, it confirms once and for all that the devil stands condemned. In essence, that's what it, that's what it refers to. Um, the spirit will do the work of condemnation in this sense. It will tell people that no matter how hard you try to beat God, you can't. No matter how hard you try to have victory over God and his plans, forget it, it's fruitless. This is where he talks about, when he talks about the, um, the, uh, the, the, the judgment because the ruler of this world is judged, he's already been told, Satan, you're going to lose. It doesn't matter how hard you try, but you're going to lose. Unfortunately, there are people who think they can beat God. Like actually just beat them. You know what? I don't need them. Huh? There are those people, many that you know, because there are many that I know. They basically make God irrelevant or they put themselves kind of on equal playing field as God. And this is more or less what Satan wanted to do. He wanted to put himself up there. He wanted to ascend and rise even above God. And the Holy Spirit, part of his ministry is to always convict people who would dare think who would dare try to understand, who would dare try to make the claim that God could somehow be defeated or his victory would not be sure. One of the things about Jesus' ascension is it was a confirmation of the sure victory of God. So, of course, they're going to get judged. Um, I'm going to stop. I'm going to stop there for now. You got to understand in my own notes, you guys, I have details on like every other sentence I spoke to you. We, so we'll, we'll stay now. We'll praise God because a miracle is being done by me <laughs> not speaking onward. Um, but I really am looking forward to, to talking to you guys more about the significance of the book of Acts and perspectives that oftentimes Christians miss. And the reason why I think the Lord lets me see these kinds of things isn't just so that you have a, a new piece of information. Oh, I never heard that one before. And, and writing it down. I think you should write it down. And I think you should study and pray for it. But I feel like the church of today, of 2018, I feel like the church in this, in this nation, the, the Christian church, um, they've, it's, it, it's bland and blandness doesn't sell. And it's so sad to see it that way, but when people think the church and all of that is bland, they, they become the lazy, they become sort of that consumer Christian. And I, and I believe that God is blessing us. I, I believe God is blessing us. I don't think that you're consumers, uh, but I still think that what God is giving us the advantage to see is that his word and his plan, they're never bland. There, there, there's always a fullness and a richness to these things. And he always wants you and I to be like on the cusp. Man, man, and then, and then as, soon as, as soon as this comes, like it pushes us over. And we do it. We should always be on the cusp of the next big thing in our Christian walk. And a lot of Christians will tell me, yeah, I'm almost there. I think God is pushing me there. I think I might serve over there. I'm like, then do it. Like, do it already. What are you standing around and thinking about it for? What if Jesus comes back tonight? What if he comes back tomorrow? And these are, these are the kinds of things I believe. One of the things I believe myself as a pastor, 
I believe that God has given me the ability to see things like that, to, to, to spur you on to, to action. And, and when I do my, my Greek studies and all this other stuff, I'm telling you, that's the purpose. I mean, I am a knowledge freak. Don't get me wrong. But I don't care. It just doesn't matter to me. Who cares? You know, back in my pre-Jesus days, I cared about having, you know, lots of knowledge. But this is, this, there's purpose. It's meaningful. So let me circle back around here. Um, the book of Acts, we're going to see this again and again and again. I promise you. I believe without a doubt I will say things in just about every study where most of you will go, oh, I didn't know that. Or wow, I've never heard it like that before. Or, or something along those lines. Good. Just don't stop. Don't stop there. Don't let this just be a really cool study that you get to talk about for a little while and then go back to life. Let it be incentive. Let it be a fire. Let it be something that drives you. It's something that moves you. Um, well, with that said, oh, I almost went off, you guys, but that's all I wanted to say for now. Um, here, we're good to go. Why don't you bow your heads, please? I'm going to lead us.